bit of an overview. I'm not going to go into a lot of technical details on, you know, the use of machine learning or AI in the subsurface or utilities market. Want to do that? Well, then come join us at the GoGeomatics in October and we can chat. You know, my role here is trying to get you excited about some of the, you know, new technologies that we're seeing in this space. And I think at this point in time, we can, you know, we're going to take a look at where we are with a lot of this slide here. Now, technology. I hear a quote here from Douglas Adams, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fame. Um, you know, one and three are quite interesting. You know, if you're born into a world where this technology has always been in existence and it's just normal, you consider it just the way it's part of it. You know, once uh, I decide to retire and decide I don't need to really keep up to the extent I have been, then it's a little like, oh yeah, that's real nice, but I don't have to worry about it too much. You know, I think right now, you know, a lot of us are in the number two area here where this is something that has been you know, machine learning has been around for a couple of decades in various forms and longer if you want to consider that. But this is now very exciting because it's become into the mainstream and we can see what it can do for us. I mean, the ideas of the large language models coming through in the last couple of years and what they can do for us is amazing. You know, it doesn't really have as much of an impact on our area because, you know, in the science and engineering end of things, we don't, we use the concepts and understand what they're doing, but we tend to have more of a niche market for that. And I'm gonna kind of walk through that a little bit and just so we can see the differences and how we things are run. So artificial intelligence. I prefer to use the term machine learning, but you know, I'll go with the flow on this. It's fairly complex, absolutely is. I mean, the mathematics and Calculus behind it is extremely complex. That's why NVIDIA's uh, share price is quite so high. But you know, understanding is quite actually simple. Basic concept, feed something enough data, tell it, I want you to figure out this or not. There are ways of saying it, just figure it out on your own. It will fail, it will fail, it will fail. And eventually it will figure out, okay, this is the best route to your conclusion or to my final conclusion. Either that or it burns out your GPU and you go buy yourself a new A A100, either way you want to look at it. You know, once you do that, then you basically say, okay, I have a model. You know, I like the term model, it's interesting, but it's really a mathematical model to say, okay, this is the equation that describes the relationship between all these complex variables. That's really all it is in the end. I'm going to push this onto the entire data set, realize, okay, that didn't work. I need better data. And really that's the crux of the matter here is we can do all sorts of things with you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, great visualizations, make informed decisions, but it all starts with the very beginning. And interesting enough, that starts with the human. If we don't have data, this doesn't work. So essentially we are trying to say, we have all this data. We already know a lot about this and we already have this data, what else can we figure out from this data? You know, humans are very good at what's called visual inference. You see something once and you know what it is, even if you don't have the complete information next time. I brought up this little uh, graphic here showing the little camel, the wombat, and the um, kangaroo there as kind of an example of what this means. Even a child knows this is probably from Australia but he knows that probably because of the kangaroo on it. A machine, you know, if you only had two thirds of that showing up, would probably never know what that is because it may have never seen all three of those. You know, if you only see a partial of that kangaroo, then even a human will look at it and go, yeah, that's Australia, I know where that is. You know, but most people even look at it and say, unless you're from Australia, of course, may not understand what the camel or wombat is for those of, you're not from Australia. Wombat is a cute, fuzzy little animal that tends to get run over a lot. That's what science for. But you know, going back to this, machines are exceptionally fast at applying some kind of rule or an algorithm. So we kind of marry these two together. Machine learning says, okay, I'm going to tell you everything I know about you know, Australian roads, about you know, underground pipes, underground manholes. And then you're gonna say, 
I have all this data. I'm going to marry these two together. And that's really what you're trying to do. You're trying to answer really two questions. What is all this data or observation telling us? Because humans have a limited capacity for going in depth into the data set. If you have an Excel spreadsheet with 30,000 records on it, you're not going to be looking at every one of them unless you're maybe in the management field. I'm not. What can we do based on these observations? The actions we can take. Now, by actions, I also mean what kind of data do you have to make sure that you are understanding what's there? And you have to be able to you know, separate the good data from the bad and understanding really what you have. There's kind of like three B, sorry, five Bs of data. Uh, this is from a paper of a couple of years back that was written uh, at the university. And they kind of show, you know, data is abundant. I can get data from anything I want. But the problem is the verification of that is it good. If the data is, you know, for example, I'm taking positions of manholes, I can get a fairly good understanding of where that manhole is with you know, the GPS on your phone. Is that good enough for you? Or do you need centimeter accuracy, in which case you're going to one of the tier one manufacturers and spending $30,000? But that's the understanding you have to have. Is this what you need? You know, the variety of the data is not in the type of data. I also look at this as more of who is looking at this data. As a geomatics engineer, I'm more concerned with the positioning of it. That is my field and my understanding. A geotech would want to know accuracy. Well, that's not quite so critical, but I want to know what else is below it. Where was this done? When was this done? And how was this collected? You know, more than, okay, I have a grid spatial position and I have these attributes. You know, these days with, you know, edge devices, IoT, you can get a lot of data very quick. You can have it sent out to you once per second, a series of information on, uh, for example, the pressure within a pipe. Uh, if it's gonna fail, um, you know, I'm in Calgary right now, so we have some issues on that. But the fact of the matter is, if we had enough data, maybe this thing could have been predicted beforehand. And that's the, what I call velocity of the data. Getting enough of it, is if you're looking for that better than how accurate is it? And you know, at the very end here, I say data is expensive. Well, you know, collecting the data may not be expensive. You know, storing it, looking at it, understanding it, that is the expensive part. Yes, a field crew is fairly expensive to get it, but it's even more expensive if the field crew gets out, picks up the paint marks on the ground, and then those paint markets were wiped out by the nearest piece of yellow iron. And you've also lost that data. It is expensive because it is collected over and over again. And that's something we need to really look at, especially in the sewer area. You know, we are always collecting data. We can collect it very quickly, very well, but we always can collect it continuously. Poor business practice, let's be honest. You know, so then you look at, you know, kind of the entire value chain of it, data, we can get that, no problem. You know, that's important for the human to do. And humans are the ones that are collecting the data in this market right now. There are changes coming, you know, basically edge devices and IOTs. But in the, in the beginning, they still are set up by the humans to say, okay, this is what we're looking for. The decision part of it, that's done by a person. The final decision is to say, okay, we cannot put the pipe in here because of this. I know people are saying, oh, yeah, but it will tell us you can't put it here. That's correct. Final decision, though, is up to the person or the engineer that has to take liability for it and say, no, we can't do that here. You know, this middle piece here, the information and visualization, that's where I see as machine learning is going to excel. It can turn data into information. There's a huge difference between data and information. Like I said, a 30,000 row Excel sheet or you know, a million records in an LLM is really nice. But unless you can glean out the little piece that you need, you can't do much with it. And, you know, the visualization piece is just as important. Humans inherently are visual thinkers. If we see a bunch of numbers on the screen, unless you're kind of a mathematics savant, 
you may not be able to distinguish a pattern to it. Whereas machine learning will basically allow you to say, oh, that's what that is, okay? So I consider the middle piece, the information to visualization to be kind of the realm of where we want machine learning to be. Yeah. General lines of data. I mean, like I said, data is not difficult to get in the subsurface utility market. The quality of the data is a different story. And what we're seeing now is that a lot of the data is becoming what's called synthetic. You get a significant portion of it as real data. You go and collect locations of the pipe, what they're used for, what they can be used for, uh, the semantics and metadata behind it. But you can also use AI itself to say, okay, construct me from that real data, synthetic data. You know, from the manufacturer, you have pipes that can withstand 20 megapixels of pressure. They are of this size. If you can take all that data in, you know, created by the AI itself and understanding it, then you have a lot more data. Uh, granted, there is a bit of a mathematical correlation that we have to understand using statistical model and simulation, but more data is better than less. We have less data, we have a problem with what's called overfitting, which is basically it forces everything to the data set when even an outlier will be rejected or ignored. And that's what we want to try to avoid. It is the outlier that we're looking for. If you think you know something's going to fail shortly, that's generally an outlier, we hope. Present uh, um, incidents being notwithstanding here around. So you have to understand, we need more data. Collecting it is not, is not expensive, but it is a slight effort. In a lot of cases, we can't even get that data if it's something underground or in areas where we don't want to send field crews. So the next ideas will be in how do we get better data? And still, we have to model this data. If you look at some of the data we get, you know, act from strictly accuracy point of view, I can tell you it's within 10 meters using my phone GPS. Is that good enough for you? Well, that's up to your data set. And we have to be able to tell the, you know, the machine learning model, the weights on this, which is really a great way of saying, you know what, this data is better than this, so consider it higher over this. There is a lot of work going on in that area, and it's a very difficult thing to do. Mathematics being what it is in the machine learning space, it's something we're looking at. So, now, in the end, what is machine learning? I mean, what we're doing is standing on the shoulders of a lot of giants in this field. Right now, I feel we have an enormous amount of you know, collaboration in this field. This is fantastic. These are just some of the you know things that I use when I'm looking for results or answers, whether I program it myself, I use services, but all these models have come out, you know, the last 10 years has been a massive proliferation of how to do this. And this, you know, from a geomatic perspective is amazing. You know, we've always seen a lot of this data is very insular, or a lot of these software programs that do work for us are very expensive and insular. I've seen some of the most amazing insights come from you know, universities or just people playing with the data and saying, hey, I can do this. Can somebody expand on this or explain this to me? There's a lot of groups, you know, I belong to several that are just playing around with things. And there's a lot of insight that's coming from this. I say stand on the shoulders of giants. There's one giant that I do not list here that I want to really give us uh, kind of a shout out too. And back in the 1800s, uh, Frederick Gauss, German mathematician, a lot of people say, you know, the machine learning came out in the last couple of decades in the last 10 years, realistically. Yeah, no, uh, Frederick Gauss had most of the basic mathematics done in the early 1800s. Uh, those of you in the geomatics field uh, understand the ideas of statistics and probability from Frederick Gauss, normalization. But the one critical aspect of the map that he did was least squares. 
Now, least squares, for those of you not in understanding the geomatics, then that's, that's normal, is that a process of taking an incredibly large overdetermined amount of data and trying to fit an equation that describes that data. Exactly what machine learning is. They say uh, Frederick Gauss had an IQ over 200. And if you look at some of the stuff that he's done, you can all stand on his shoulders and look and say, this is what we're doing. So just to kind of reiterate, this is not a new field. We've just got the tools now to be able to say, we can do better and we have done better. I'm gonna give a couple of examples of projects, primarily in you know, the subsurface utilities area. There's an uh, algorithm called YOLO, you only look once. It is an attempt by machine learning to say, if I see it once, I understand it. I'm not gonna go into the, uh, the technical details of that. If you want that, again, talk to us at GoGematics and we'll, we, can, we can chat. I'd love to see people there. It basically allows you to, it's, it's a model that allows us to look at data once to say, okay, this is what an expert has said is significant. And that's the critical piece here. Anybody who's thinking that a lot of this is gonna take the experts out of the equation is incorrect. At the very beginning, if you don't have experts looking at this and saying, yes, this is significant, then machine learning tends to go off on a rail and find all sorts of things that it doesn't. So it has to be reined in. And what we found here is we had, you know, a, a geophysicist look at and say, okay, in this, this is, you know, a time depth slice for a GPR, you say, okay, these are the things that I want to look at or I want to be able to be shown to me. Does, you know, a hundred different images, different slices at different times, different frequencies, different, different ground conditions say this is, and he picks up and says, this is what I want to look at. We then let this go onto the algorithm and say, from these 100, you have a thousand more, go. And not all of these are correct. Absolutely not. We're getting about a 70% you know, correction on this, and that's fine. If you can take 70% of your work away from you, you know, the mundane part of it, then you're doing extremely well. So it's difficult to interpret, but you only have to have the experienced person at the very beginning and let the machine take the kind of the drudgery out of it. Another example uh, we're working on right now is trying to find out, you know, what's called instance or object cementation. Either you remove or detect objects from a certain area. If you have a point cloud coming from a you know, LIDAR or photogrammetry or what have you, and you want to be able to move it to the ground, remove everything that is not ground, this is a great app, you know, idea for what's called instant segmentation. This allows you to look at this, say, okay, these are defined as vehicles. I say cars, because a car is much different from a truck, much different from a van, and they will be pull differently on what this YOLO objects does. So what we're seeing is a lot of different ideas of and different applications of how we can use machine learning within our whole you know, subsurface utility. Yes, it can get you an idea, okay, do not put a pipe here because there's already five in here and you have to be you know, more than three feet below ground and two feet from the nearest gas line. It can do that. Sure, that's not a big deal. We've been able to do that for quite some time. It's not an, that's called an expert system. But now we are basically allowed to have an understanding what's below there and understand that, you know, now the data says we are within this. Oh, by the way, you can't do that. You have to move this. So you're taking the human out of the drudgery part of the equation. And that's really what we want to do. We want to do interesting things, not just the little fuzzy things of continuously, you know, segmenting out cars or tracing lines on a AutoCAD sheet. That's not the fun part. We wanna have some interesting insights. Last couple of thoughts here before I go for questions. Why do we do machine learning? Well, let's be honest, we need this to have a positive impact. This has to be, you know, increase safety, increase revenue, uh, decrease field work. This has to have some purpose to it. You know, if I know we do a lot of this for just for fun because it's intellectually stimulating, but in a commercial environment, take a look at why are you doing this? This has to have some understanding of what to do. In a lot of cases, what we found is that 
a lot of the model complexity, I mean, a lot of the data that you put in, you know, don't put everything in there. You know, you're over constraining it. If you can say, okay, 20% of the, you know, features that I want out of this are already pushed in there or already will give me 80% of what I need, take that. You've got to have to look at this and say, is it worth the cost and effort to go to the full, you know, I need, I need 100%. Well, no, you don't. You're never going to get that. The two, as a geomatics engineer, these next two are something I harp on my junior engineers about. If all you need, if all you're doing is looking for a 72 inch concrete pipe, don't chase the millimeters. You know, you're not going to dig to within a millimeter of a pipe or a fiber optic line. If you can get, you know, 90% of the way there without causing, you know, safety issues, that's all you need. Because when you chase from millimeters to set, sorry, meters to centimeters to millimeters, your cost goes up by a factor of 10 each time. Okay? And the other corollary to that, don't chase the millimeters when you can't justify that kind of accuracy. All you're doing is using your phone as a GPS. Well, don't quote me down to four or five decimal places. We know it's not correct. But the problem is people see that, you know, people see three decimal places on a depth. They assume that it's correct to the millimeter. Horrible, horrible oversimplification. So, always look at this. The best solution is never the quickest one. If it's the quickest one, then I would just send out a locator, mark the ground, and be done with it. That's not the best solution. And the problem is not looking at what's there now. It's understanding what's, what's there now, what's there two weeks from now, what's there 10 years from now, and when and how did we put this in. So do not skimp on the data. If, you, if you're already out there collecting the data, collect it all and collect it properly. I think in the next little while, I think we're gonna see kind of a step change in how machine learning is, is working in the engineering space, not just the subsurface. You know, we've come to the point where the amount of data that we're getting is fantastic. I mean, and the amount of insights we've gotten and the amount of people working on this, you know, we're gonna see some great leaps forward in this. And that comes from the final quote there. Electric light did not come from the continuous improvement of candles. We had a step change electricity. The next big thing came in. So with that, and I want to thank you for every, you know, listening to my little blur here on, you know, AI and machine learning and how we're actually kind of using it and what we see is going on. If there's any questions, uh, please feel free to speak up now and I will do the best I can to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. That was great. Very informative. Uh, yeah, everybody, please put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, I see that we've got a question there. Uh, I'm going to hit the answer live button. Are you able to see, Peter, the question from Surrender? I do not. Please read it out to me. I don't know why I don't see it. I will um, try. Uh, maybe stop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stop sharing. Okay, there we go. Sorry. Uh, Surinder, greetings from India. Well, thank you for uh, joining in. This must be very early. There's a difference between data analytics and machine learning. Absolutely. You know, data analytics, machine learning is letting the machine do it. Data analytics is taking the results from there and figuring it out. Absolutely. Uh, machine learning is based on the idea that machines should be able to learn and adapt through experience. ARI refers to a broader Yes, okay, I see what you're saying. Broader idea where machines can execute tasks smartly. Artificial intelligence applies, machine learning, deep learning, and other techniques to also actual problems, yes. You know, is the convergence of these four techniques that synergy can be obtained? Absolutely, I mean, that is a great, great question, and thank you very much, Surrender. You know, you're absolutely correct. We are not at artificial intelligence, you know, or the general artificial intelligence that, that uh, everybody seems to think. We are at the point of machine learning. Really, we are at the point of you know, neural networks and deep learning, where we're basically taking the data and understanding what we can from it. If we get to the artificial intelligence stage, we don't really need to, you know, it gets to the point where you would understand that that is a kangaroo and that has to be Australia without being told that. Like any you know, five-year-old child will be able to do that for you. Are we there yet? No, we're not. Uh, soon, 
That's hard to say. We've been saying maybe, maybe, maybe for the last few years where we convergence to a, you know, an artificial general intelligence. That's tough to say. And I I don't want to, I'd like to go on a limb and say, yeah, give us five years, we'll figure this out. But we've been saying that for a lot of years. So I'd love to see it. Thank you. Okay. Great answer. Uh, uh, Peter, I'm going to uh, take the opportunity to ask a question um, that I think it's asked a lot about uh, AI. Um, what are the dangers um, of using AI in this type of work? Uh, have you run into anything already? Well, we have. The dangers are in, well, typical human making the assumption it's correct. You know, I kind of went over a little bit of that saying, okay, you know, you're giving me millimeter solutions when I know very well that you didn't have that kind of accuracy. The problem is, you know, when something is written, it is considered in stone. Or if I tell somebody you are at this location and I give you an exact number, I don't tell them, you don't assume that it is any error to that. You know, machine learning gives you answers to answers based on what you put in. If what you've put in is absolute garbage, you're going to get absolute garbage out, but it's going to be very pretty. And I think that's kind of the danger of what we're looking at here is that you make assumptions that this is correct. You know, humans by themselves, if you give them some data that they've collected, they go, okay, that's, that's relatively accuracy. It's good enough for my purpose. What we're seeing now is when something like artificial, you know, machine learning or the large language models come out and say, you know what, this is your answer. You assume it's correct even though we know very well that a lot of the large language models, you know, hallucinate. They infer from what they have, correct or not, you know, I can't blame the machine learning for that. It's programmed by humans, but it says, this is the answer and you take it without thinking, is this correct? The human's still in the loop. It should stay in the loop. Great. Uh, we've got a uh, question that came in through the chat. So it's from an anonymous attendee. Um, are, right. are there hands-on hands short professional courses on geomatics and client data sciences? Yes, there is. I mean, I've gone to a lot of courses on the Coursera. Uh, I find that's one of the better ones, to be honest. Um, one of the instructors there is Andrew Ning. You ever had a chance to go through a course by him? It's amazing. He really is one of the fathers of machine learning. And he goes through a lot of the, you know, I, being an engineer, I like the math and the hard science is part of it. So he goes through a lot of that. So it's, there are ones, um, you know, like I said, if you want to go talk to me more about the understanding of machine learning and geomatics, come chat with us at Go Geomatics in October. And then we'll see what it is. Hopefully, you know, talk to people who are in the field. We are love to chat about it. We're all kind of geeky, kind of nerdy people. So we love to talk about what we do. You know, that's right now, that's where a lot of the, uh, I guess the knowledge is being passed on is it's in, you know, the people who tried this, failed at it and say, yeah, don't do that. It didn't work. So hard to answer Maybe that. On that note, formal courses. sorry. Uh, sorry to interrupt. On that note, you mentioned the Goji Maddox Expo uh, in October. Can you give us a, um, a taste of the programs that you're running there for the Expo? Absolutely, we, yeah. We have to go over to the break. Okay, uh, yeah, just one little thing there. I'm kind of heading up the, uh, the AI um, in the geomatic space, and also I'm looking at you know presenting in the subsurface utility area of things. So if there's people out there who are interested in either presenting you know, putting together a kind of a session or want to make a talk, please, please, uh, my contact information is right there on the last slide. Come talk to me. We have slots available for those who are you know, interested in sharing their knowledge about the machine learning end of things uh, in GMAX, or it doesn't have to be. It can be a general topic. It's always not very valuable or in the subsurface utility. So I am absolutely happy to hear any submissions or presentations available. This is October, uh, Jonathan, you probably know the right date. Uh, October 28th to the 30th. Yeah. yeah. So please feel free to chat with us anytime. My contact information is there. I love to hear from people. If you want to say, hey, you know, what do you think about this? Drop me a line. Always interested in talking. That's the kind of the beauty of this kind of forum 
is exactly what it's for. So thank you.